Hello and welcome. Today I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the phases of cloud adoption. As you'd imagine at HashiCorp, uh, we've seen everything from the good, the bad, and the ugly in terms of how organizations go about adopting cloud. But ultimately, I think we've seen enough different patterns that we've almost been able to kind of simplify it into what we call a cloud 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0 framework in terms of how we see most organizations adopting cloud. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that framework and what are the different sort of signs and kind of approaches that we see within each of those kind of 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0 phases of cloud adoption. So where we see most people start their cloud journey is in what I'll call kind of the 1.0 motion, right? And in cloud 1.0, most organizations start by realizing, hey, we have a critical need to start innovating more rapidly on our applications. Time to market is more important to us. And so how do we start to embrace cloud as part of our sort of digital transformation? So it's really a focus on improving our agility of our development teams, really enabling teams to deliver applications faster uh, and more easily. And so typically that becomes the starting point, the catalyst for an organization to start with cloud. Now I think where most people start then is by saying, great, let's go to one of our preferred cloud partners. We're gonna sign an enterprise agreement with them. Maybe we commit you know, several million dollars and spend to them. And then great, we're gonna give those keys to our development teams and allow them to start building applications directly on cloud, right? So in this first phase, it's usually driven by the business need, which is how do we go faster? How do we really enable our digital transformation? We light that up by signing an agreement with one of the major cloud providers, and then we give access and credentials to our development teams and service teams and say, hey, knock yourself out, go start building applications in cloud, right? Now, almost invariably, the challenge ends up being in this sort of 1.0 motion. What we've really done is create a bit of a Wild West scenario, right? We've given keys, we've given credentials, and we've given it to our application and said, go run free, do whatever you want. And so almost inevitably, 12 months, 18 months later, you end up with a number of problems, right? Which is you now have things like, you know, account and resource sprawl, because each of these teams are just running free and kind of doing whatever they want. You have sort of a, you know, no consistency of approach, right? Meaning each of these application teams is provisioning accounts in different ways, they're managing VPCs in different ways, you know, there's no real shared patterns or blueprints in terms of how people are building and defining and managing infrastructure. And so typically a result of that is you end up with a number of problems. One is, you know, cost overruns because you've just sort of opened up the floodgates and said, go free. And the second problem is you usually end up with a number of security and compliance challenges. Uh, and the reason for that is oftentimes there's a divide in most organizations between who cares and is responsible for those things. Typically a central security team or central compliance teams own and manage that. But in this model, what we did is basically open up the floodgates, give credentials to the app teams and tell them to run free. Those application teams are more focused on adding features, delivering capabilities than they are necessarily on the security and compliance requirements of an organization. So oftentimes what ends up happening is 12, 18 months into what we call sort of this cloud 1.0 approach, these issues sort of come to the front, right? And all of a sudden we see either the CIO organization or the CISO organization say, pause, we need to reevaluate our strategy to cloud because what we're doing is creating chaos, right? We have 50 app teams doing things 50 different ways. We don't have proper security controls, cost controls, policy guardrails. It's the wild west. So oftentimes organizations hit pause on this and say, hey, how do we rethink our approach to cloud? Instead, we need to be much more intentional so this often gets to what we call a 2.0 notion of thinking about the cloud, which is rather than just let every application team directly interface and do whatever they want, it's how do we be slightly more measured and say, great, we still wanna enable cloud, but we wanna put a consistent platform layer in place. This platform layer will then give us an opinionated way of how we're interfacing and consuming cloud it gives us an aperture for how we now define consistent ways of defining and deploying and managing infrastructure. It allows us to manage our cost and put proper guardrails in place and allows us to have a single point that we're imposing common security controls, compliance controls, ensuring we have visibility. In short, it's about being intentional about how we're consuming cloud and really trying to recognize that great, once I have 50 or 100 app teams doing it, I really wanna have a consistent set of ways of doing it so I'm not managing it in 100 unique ways. Right? 
So this introduction of a platform team usually then becomes the sort of aperture through which we start consuming cloud. And then great, all of those application teams, they become internal customers of this platform team, right? So this tends to be either, you know, some organizations that are either, I'll call it very mature platform-based organizations to begin with, they might start their cloud journey here because they're used to having a strong platform-led approach to infrastructure. For many organizations that are not used to a strong platform, they might start with, you know, this 1.0 motion, run into some of these challenges, and then recognize the need to define either, you know, they might call it a platform team or sometimes a, you know, a DevOps team, an SRE team. You see it come by many different names. It might be a cloud center of excellence. But effectively, it's this idea that we're going to create a single group of platform owners. Their job is to build and maintain this layer. And then I'm going to have many different teams, right? So these are the sort of application teams, right? Versus the platform or the sort of ops teams who are going to own this central layer, right? And so then this starts to allow us to address these pieces, which is what we really want to get to is how do we define some patterns, right, that are common, right? So if every one of these application teams needs to deploy a Mongo database, I don't want to do it in 50 different ways, right? I want a consistent way that I'm doing that so I can put the right policy and controls around it and I only have to manage it one time. That really becomes a key part of this, which is really from a security and compliance perspective, can I do it in a centralized way? But then ultimately, it's really about thinking about how am I scaling this out to many different app teams? which is ultimately a question of how do I get leverage at scale, right? Because in this approach, yeah, generally in any given organization, there's a handful of very sophisticated, mature teams. You can give them the Amazon credentials and say, go run free. But then there's a long tail of teams that are not as mature. They're not as aware of how to manage cloud infrastructure, how to do DevOps, how to manage CI CD pipelines. So when we think about this, it's really about then how do I service not that 20% of my really mature users but the 80%, the long tail, that they want a little bit more help, they want a little bit more opinionation about how to actually do this, right? And so then ultimately, I think once this model starts gaining maturity and gaining traction, I think this tends to lead into what we call a 3.0 approach. And so a 3.0 is really, in some sense, an extension of the work that's happening in 2.0. Primarily, what starts to happen is once we've defined that central platform, and that's become the aperture, basically, for all of our application teams to come in and consume. Then the question becomes, great, well, we've enabled this to work with our, you know, you know, our single public cloud, which is where we started our journey. But then this becomes the same vehicle to enable us to do multi-cloud effectively. And I think the ultimate extension of this is really starting to recognize, why can't we apply these same practices to our private data center? I think that's what really starts completing the journey is when people start to realize, great, what we really enabled here is our ability to automate and get that sort of DevOps ability to enable self-serve for our users, right? So what we really accomplished was self-serve at scale because now we're getting the leverage of many different application teams sharing this platform. Often as part of that, we're adopting sort of cloud ways of working. Right? So typically these platforms are introducing concepts like CI CD, they're introducing infrastructure as code, they might be enabling a shift to sort of Kubernetes and containerized based ways of deploying applications. And so then the question becomes, why can't I get all those same benefits in my private data center environment? And the, the answer is you can. I mean, cloud is really more about, it's a way of working rather than where you're working. And so many of those same principles, whether we talk about CI CD or infrastructure as code, those can all be applied to private data center environment. So I think at full maturity, when organizations get to this 3.0, it's really about extending and saying we have a common platform approach now that spans our you know, multi-cloud efforts as well as our private data center efforts. The goal being that I'm shielding my underlying application teams, my service teams, from really having to be an expert of understanding the nuances of the different environments or whether it's public or private cloud. They just want to focus on building and deploying their applications. Right. And so if I overlay this with how this tends to be a conversation with HashiCorp and our tooling, oftentimes organizations start adopting our open source in this sort of 1.0 motion, right? Development teams might pick up tools like Terraform to start provisioning infrastructure, Vault to manage secrets and put it in their CI/CD pipelines, 
Maybe they're using console to enable discovery between their different applications. And so most of the time organizations start with our open source here and it's just development teams and app teams pulling it in, using it, solving their problem and, and sort of running as fast as they can. As we move into sort of the 2.0 framework and the 3.0 framework, that tends to be the transition for us into more of our commercial tool offerings because really it's a focus on how do we enable these platform teams to offer all of our products as a service to their customers, right? The underlying app teams. So now what we really care about is how do I enable multi-tenancy? Because I have many different tenants on these shared platforms. Oftentimes I care about, you know, if it's a core platform, am I building in the right level of high availability, disaster recovery? Am I hardening this into sort of a tier one service internally where I'm then offering and enabling it to many, many app teams internally? So now I care much more about, you know, building an HA high availability sort of a platform. And then lastly, it's around things like how do I enable common patterns? That might be things like using Terraform private registry. How do I enable security controls and compliance controls? That may be leveraging some of our policy as code capabilities, some of the governance capabilities, certainly includes things like single sign-on, role-based access control, where we really wanna be thinking about how do I build this platform such that I'm getting that leverage, that I'm imposing the right policy and governance, but I'm also enabling it in a multi-tenant way. I don't wanna manage a bespoke platform one instance of it for every one of my tenants, right? That doesn't scale if I have to support hundreds of app teams. And then as we come to this world, it's really about leveraging our, you know, the tooling to create a consistent approach across multi-cloud and private data center. And I think this is where then HashiCorp tools really shine is when we talk about a tool like Terraform, great, it's the same underlying workflow, whether I'm deploying it to Amazon, Google, Azure, or my on-premise environment. Vault, same thing. I have one set of APIs, one workflow around how I'm doing secret and key management, but I can integrate it and apply it across all these environments in a consistent way, right? Console, same thing. How do I enable service networking and discovery across all of this? How do I normalize my ability to do micro-segmentation and govern access of an application in cloud talking to an application on-premise? We can start normalizing all of that. So that really becomes sort of the transition for us from, uh, from a HashiCorp perspective where we tend to start with organizations, they're using our open source and sort of a tactical cloud in the 1.0. And as they move into a more mature kind of intentional design around kind of 2.0 and 3.0, that becomes a commercial conversation around how to use the enterprise version of the products to really enable their application teams at scale. Hopefully this was helpful in terms of just the patterns we see as organizations go from sort of tactical cloud adoption to really enabling sort of cloud as a strategic platform, and then moving from that from a single cloud into sort of a multi or hybrid cloud pattern. Thanks so much.